Hi, it's Katrina. Number 10. The Most Effective Weapons it wasn't only a superior strategy that made the Roman military so effective, it was also their weapons. Each weapon in the Roman arsenal had a distinct purpose and a specific role. For example, the Pugio was a type of dagger typically used for an assassination. Brutus murdered Julius Caesar by stabbing him with a Pugio, which later symbolized the power over life and death. But in actual battle, there were three principal weapons that the Romans used. The gladius was among the most treasured. It was a sword, but a strictly Roman sword. The gladius was long. Every Roman soldier had one, and it was highly effective for close quarters fighting. As soldiers blocked with their shield, they could thrust out or slash at the enemy with their gladius. Another thing it was good at was slicing kneecaps. It's one thing that made the gladius such a popular weapon. Roman captains trained their soldiers to go for the enemy's knees slicing their kneecaps and rendering them useless. The most notorious weapon of the Roman legions was the pilum, which was a special type of spear. It was a type of throwing spear, its tip made of hard iron and its shank made of soft iron. When a Roman soldier stabbed this spear into the enemy, it would snap off with the tip inside of them. This method would make the wound almost certainly fatal while making the now blunt weapon useless. There were also all kinds of other weapons. The Romans used weighted darts to throw at enemies, which they carried attached to their shields. They eventually invented an upgraded gladius in the 3rd century called the Spatha, used by heavy infantry. And then they had other weapons like the Onager, a tiny catapult, and the Carrobalista, which was a small weapon launcher that ponies could carry. There was a weapon for every season. Number 9. The Mutiny of 342 BC Like most other armies, the Roman army would have some problems now and again. One of their more unusual difficulties came in 342 BC, when the Roman army mutinied. The mutiny started at a Roman garrison of soldiers in Campania, according to historical records. They were camped there to protect the cities against the Samnites. But the Roman soldiers were so ruthless, they decided instead of wintering in their camps to protect the region from an invasion, they should invade the cities themselves. So they conspired to take Campania over and rebelled against their leaders. When word of this reached Rome, Marcus Valerius Corvus was named dictator and given ultimate power so that he could deal with the situation. The rebel army found out about this and decided they would march on Rome and take over the heart of the Republic. But an opposing army thrown together by Corvus met them on the way. The troops struck a deal with the leaders and there was not an ounce of bloodshed. It was one of the most peaceful ends of a mutiny in history. Plus, the rebellion helped to make some significant changes in Rome. After 342 BC, political reform started and the Republic began its shift to an empire. Number 8. Hardcore Training The Roman soldiers won so many battles and were so feared because they trained relentlessly. Recruits into the army underwent some of the most hardcore training imaginable. The intense training transformed them from average farmers and peasants into killing machines dedicated to the Roman Empire. Physical training included challenging activities like swimming, riding, and marching for miles and miles. These intense activities increased the soldiers' strength and stamina. In addition, there were weapons and armor training drills to make sure soldiers were familiar with their equipment. By the time they finished their training, every soldier was an expert with spears, swords, slings, bows, and large artillery weapons. They also knew how to use nothing but their shield as a deadly tool in combat. And to make these skills even more helpful in battle, the practice equipment was made of extremely thick wood, even heavier than the actual weapons. Besides turning the Romans into killing machines, they were also taught how to work together. They were highly disciplined, and their commanders even pitted them against one another to gain battle experience before marching into war. Every soldier had to swear never to leave their post, never to steal from the Roman army, never abandon their weapons, never flee, and promise to die for Mother Rome. Could you handle it? Number 7. Specialized Tactics Even today, military schools all over the globe study Roman military tactics. The testudo, or tortoise, was one of the unique tactics employed by the soldiers. 
It was a formation where they locked their shields together to create a 360-degree wall between them and their enemies. The front rank of the formation would kneel with their shields over their heads, and the men right behind them would do the same, until they had created a dome of impenetrable defense. They even designed their shields with sharp curves to deflect incoming artillery while interlocking them easily. The formation was called the tortoise because even though they could move forward with all their shields interlocked, they moved at about the speed of a turtle. The soldier's formation allowed them to march across a field protected from long-range aerial attacks. Before the Romans, the Greeks had used the phalanx. The Romans perfected the technique into the triple line. They would make up the front line from the least experienced men. Behind them were the principals, and the veterans were in the back. The men in the front would launch javelins at the approaching enemy, then scuttle behind the second line as they threw their spears. This tactic went on and on in a kind of rotating line of advancing soldiers, each hurling their weapons at the incoming enemy threat. The British soldiers used this same type of formation during the Revolutionary War against the colonists in the United States. Finally, we have the wedge. This formation was when the soldiers would form a wedge shape or a big V. The sharp point of the wedge drove into the center of enemy soldiers. Then the soldiers gradually expanded to divide the enemy forces. It was like driving a wedge into the center of the army the Romans were fighting. The point of the wedge comprised the most experienced and skilled troops, creating a concentrated killing fist. This fist pushed confused enemies to the outer edges of the wedge, where the Romans cut them down. Number 6. Decimation Although we use the word today to describe any large-scale defeat, decimation technically means the removal of a tenth. Roman leaders used it as a punishment when something went wrong in a Roman legion. For example, if soldiers fled, rebelled, or didn't perform well enough in combat, commanders would single them out and punish them using decimation. The leaders would divide a specific body of troops into groups of 10 men. They would then choose one soldier from each group of 10 at random through a lottery. His fellow soldiers would beat this unlucky chosen man to death. It didn't matter the victim's rank, whether they were a commander or a lowly foot soldier. If they drew the short straw, their friends beat them to death, using clubs or heavy rocks to get the job done. The whole point of decimation was to keep the soldiers so afraid that they would never run away, never break the line, and never even think about mutiny. And indeed, the looming threat of decimation hanging above the soldiers' heads worked to keep the Roman army one of the most disciplined the world has ever seen. Do you think decimation was an intelligent tactic on behalf of Roman rulers or just barbaric torture? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Number 5. The Ambush at Teutoburg Forest The most significant military defeat the Romans ever suffered was at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. It was so devastating that it changed history. In the year 9 AD, an alliance of Germanic people ambushed Roman legions and the Roman auxiliaries, moving through the Teutoburg Forest. The Germanic officer Arminius led the ambush, while the Roman general Publius Quinctilius Varus had the unfortunate privilege of being the one to lead all of his men into a slaughter. The thing about Arminius was that the Roman military had trained him. He was just as skilled as any commander in the Roman army, and so he could use their tactics against them. He hit the three Roman legions as they were marching through the woods in a thin and poorly defended line, about 12 miles long. The attackers flanked the Romans, preventing them from getting into any kind of defensive formation. It wasn't even a battle, it was a slaughter. Several groups of Romans survived the initial onslaught and made camp deeper in the woods. But when they tried to escape the next day, Arminius sprang his second trap and cut them off at the edge of the Great Bog. He slaughtered all the remaining Roman survivors. About 20,000 Romans died, and the defeat put an end to Roman expansion under the Emperor Augustus. Number 4. The Roman Legion The Roman army conquered tribes, clans, confederations, and every empire in their way, and they did it with superior military strategy. Of course, economic and political strength helped as well, but the Roman army was the backbone of their power and that backbone had to be appropriately structured. The Roman army's strategy was basic. Each large section of the army was called a legion. They formed every legion from 4,800 legionaries, who were Roman citizens. Inside the legion were cohorts of 480 men each. They divided each cohort into six centuries, comprising 80 men, controlled by a single centurion. 
Among the centuries, they would divide soldiers into smaller groups, and everyone was given their own job. Plus, every legion had a cavalry unit of 300 men. But there were other layers to the army as well. The Roman auxiliary was made up of men who weren't full Roman citizens. They paid them less money than legionnaires, about a sixth less, and they were required to complete 25 years of service before they could receive full Roman citizenship for themselves and their families. That's a long time. By 130 AD, the auxiliaries outnumbered the legions by quite a lot, and by 210 AD, there were roughly 447,000 soldiers in the Roman army. Number 3. The Roman Ranks The details of Roman military ranks are far more complicated than just the legions and the cohorts and the centuries. For example, senior officers in the Roman legion were divided into five major categories. There was the Legatus Legionis, he was the legion commander, and the emperor almost always appointed him himself. This person would hold command over 5,000 men for between three and four years, sometimes even being given more than one legion to rule over. Second in command was the Tribunus Laticlavius, typically younger and less experienced, and chosen by the emperor or the senate. His job was to carry out the wishes of the legatus. The Praefectus Castrorum was a veteran of the army that leaders promoted through the ranks of centurions to become the third in command. He looked after the camps, doing more of the day-to-day -day stuff. The Legatus was the supreme commander, and the Praefectus was the staff supervisor. There were five Tribuni Angusticlavi, considered knight-class citizens. They were career officers who had full tactical command over about 1,000 soldiers per legion. Primus Pilus was the commanding centurion of the first cohort and the master centurion of all the legions. There were about 60 centurions per legion, but the Primus Pilus was the most important. Number 2. General Scipio Africanus Most historians consider Scipio Africanus as the most significant military general in the history of Rome. He saved Rome from savage attacks from outsiders, he defeated the legendary Hannibal, and he helped lay out the foundation for Rome's eventual expansion across the seas to new worlds. When Scipio was just a boy, Hannibal Barca invaded Italy and massacred the people of Cannae. He witnessed the whole thing, and it changed him. As he grew into a young man, he studied Hannibal, learned all he could about military tactics, and crept up through the Roman ranks. When he eventually became general, his only goal was to destroy Hannibal and get revenge for the slaughter at Cannae. And that's precisely what he did. He used the incredible power of the Roman army to chase Hannibal out of what is now Spain. He then turned his attention to the heart of Carthage and won in Africa at the Battle of Zama. His first victory in Spain was monumental. He was just 26 years old. Even though he had a much smaller force than that of Carthage, his superior genius helped him win the day. And in Africa, he did the same thing. He wiped out the Carthaginian horsemen, used a revolutionary pincer move to trap his enemies, and destroyed Hannibal's forces. By the time Scipio was finished, he had conquered Spain, made Carthage a Roman client state, and moved the Romans into Africa. Number 1. The Transition from Militia to Legion the Roman army was not always so fierce and well-organized. In the early Roman Republic, there was no army. Instead, they used a citizen-based militia until around 157 BC. The men in the militia were recruited from ordinary citizens, and it was not even a paying job. Those in the militia couldn't be paid until they finished whatever battle or war they were fighting. It wasn't until Gaius Marius changed the rules that these Roman soldiers became part of the full-time army. And in the beginning, a lot of the Roman tactics were just old Greek tactics taken from the colonists. They used the Greek phalanx system in battle for decades before coming up with their own moves. As a result, the army was kind of miserable for the first few centuries. Soldiers had to purchase and maintain their own equipment. And rather than dividing soldiers into units based on skill, they were divided based on wealth. It wasn't until the First Punic War against Carthage in the 3rd century BC that the legion finally came into being. It took over 300 years and the confrontation of a great enemy for Rome to develop the powerful military force we remember today. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye!